um, Portugal has never had a, 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 an export strategy for the music industry. And um, because I lived in Canada for many years and also worked in London, um, uh, when, I, when I came back to Portugal in 2008, I realized that Portugal didn't have the infrastructures like a, an independent music trade association, uh, an export office. Um, it's still missing several other industry institutions that exist in other countries, like we have no um, uh, live venues network um, that could then plug into European networks. So the same way that AME, which is the, the Portuguese Independent Trade Association, plugs into Impala in Brussels, and the same way that Why Portugal plugs into the European Music Exporters Exchange, um, each subsector in the music business has its own cluster. Um, and for example, because we don't have an artist organization, we are not connected to the international artist organization. Because we don't have a venues association, we're not connected to live EMA. And so Portugal is still missing a lot of these infrastructures, uh, which exist in uh, more developed music markets, um, but not others. So when I got back to Portugal in 2008, um, I was working as an artist manager and booking agent. And, um, and the first step uh, really was to start the Independent Trade Association. Uh, so we started AME in 2012. And then the different internal working groups inside AME started um, developing other projects. So one was the International Development Group. And that's the group that eventually, uh, in 2016, became autonomous from the trade association AME and turned into Why Portugal as a separate business trade association um, in, in a different city even. Uh, so AME is headquartered in Lisbon and uh, Why Portugal is headquartered in Leiria, which is in the center of the country. And, um, and it really, whereas AME is an association for independent labels. Why Portugal is an export office for everybody. So for major artists, as well as up and coming independent artists. It's, it's, it's a, a, a music exchange platform for the entire cluster, including the live sector, uh, the recorded sector, you know, festivals, uh, all, the, all the professionals that are um, working in the music industry as a whole. Um, and meanwhile, we also recognized that Portugal did not have um, an industry conference, uh, a showcase event, an industry conference like Waves. Um, so in 2014, uh, Rui Turinha, who is also participating here in, in Vienna, um, and I co-founded the Westway Lab in Guimarães, uh, which is now going on to its sixth edition um, next year. And um, what I said, I mean, AME already existed. So AME was first in 2012. And then Westway Lab, we started working on the idea of, of a showcase conference right away in 2012. It took two years to, to, to get the first edition um, to happen. And when I started talking to Rui, I, I, what I said to him was very simple. I said, Portugal needs a professional music event. We need um, what we call Missão Inversa, the, 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 the re reverse mission to invite professionals to come and meet uh, the Portuguese music industry. And we need a showcase festival to join the ETEP network, which is the European Talent Exchange Program that's part of Eurosonic in the Netherlands. Um, well, that was founded by Eurosonic in the Netherlands. And that's like 100 festivals all over Europe uh, participating in this Creative Europe funded project. And Roy said to me, which I thought was very funny at the end, he said, he said, I said, we need a showcase festival and a conference. And he said, that's not good enough. 
So what, what do you mean? We don't have a showcase. You know, we need a showcase in the conference. They said, no, there's already lots of these events around Europe. We need to do something <coughs> different. And I said, well, you can't reinvent the wheel. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a showcase uh, for, for, for new talents that want to internationalize themselves and a conference for capacity building and professional development in the music business. So what else, is, what else do you need? He said, no, no, give me a couple weeks. I'll get back to you. I said, okay. And, um, and then he phoned me back a couple weeks later and he said, I have an idea. Why don't we do the Westway Lab in Guimaraes, which is the, the, was the founding, the birth city of Portugal. That's where the country was founded. I'm terrible with history, but what year? 1,017 something maybe, or it was like almost a thousand years ago. Uh, anyway, Rui said to me, he said, so <coughs> we're going to do the Showcase Festival uh, with, with the professional conference, and we're going to have artist residencies. Um, mixed artist residencies between Portuguese artists and international artists who come uh, a week before to work together in a, a school that's been converted to a creative center. Um, and then they will write new compositions together and present them at the festival. And I thought to myself, <coughs> um, self, that's going to be incredibly difficult to convince, for example, uh, a UK agent to have an artist for 10 days earning a very small fee stuck in the same place instead of being on the road earning the full concert fee every night on tour, which is of course what agents want. <coughs> um, so I said this to Rui and he said, yes, of course, I know it will be a challenge, but nobody said it was easy. Let's try and make a go of it. and." Um, and we went to Eurosonic in 2014. And then Rui went back to Guimarães and we invited a bunch of artists to participate in the first Westway Lab in 2014. And uh, we, as expected, received a lot of turndowns from the UK agents with the more established artists. But we received a lot of interest from artist managers and publishers. So, um, and Rui got the idea because he works he works in a in a in a cultural center that is working not just with music but with theater and dance and and uh, you know contemporary circus. So, in, in the other creative disciplines that he works with, a residency is normal. Like, there's residencies in theater and other, it's, it's just, to me it felt <coughs> weird because I hadn't heard of it in music, you know. Of course we have songwriting camps for publishers for a specific purpose, but in terms of getting artists together and making new music and creating a side project that then plays a show, I'd never seen that before. Um, and so the first, the first year in 2014, it's funny because uh, all these years later, we've had this exchange between Austria and Portugal with the country focus of Austria at Westway and Portugal here at Waves. But even in the very first Westway, one of the, uh, one of the projects that participated in the residencies was an Austrian project called Ghost Capsules. And so Ghost Capsules came and worked uh, with the bass player from a band from Braga called Peixe of Young, which, mean, which means fish an airplane, and they're sort of like a, well, it's, it's unfair to them, but they get compared to Radiohead a lot. And, but they sing in Portuguese, it's really melodic. Um, anyway, and uh, Reini was the agent, the Austrian agent for Ghost Capsules, and the manager for Ghost Capsules was a, a UK manager by the name of Daryl Bamonte. And Daryl Bamonte, I think, is the only international delegate to have been at Westway every single year since. Um, and he's got his own story. He was like the fifth member of Depeche Mode, then he managed Robert Smith from The Cure. And so that's how Westway got started. And then moving forward to 2016, when 
well, the way it happened was because Westway joined the ETEP network and we started being more present in Eurosonic. Eurosonic invited um, us, in that case it was Ame back then, uh, to lead on the Portugal country focus at Eurosonic, which happened in 2017. <coughs> my, my answer at the time to, to Peter Smith and, and Lou Berens is, uh, well, I don't think that the Independent Trade Association could do this. I mean, the Independent Trade Association in Portugal is pretty much the only entity that you can speak to at this point, back in 2015, or no, 2014. Um, but an independent label association is not the right body to lead on, on a country focus. There, it should be an export office. And they said, well, we know, but there is no export office in Portugal, so can you do it? And that's, that was the catalyst for then, for AME to create Y Portugal, um, to include also the major labels and the right societies and the rest of the sector, the life sector as well, um, in order to lead on the Eurosonic country focus. And, and, uh, and so that's how Y Portugal came about. Um, it has the support of the cultural funds from the two neighboring rights societies, so Audiogest and GDA, which is the photograph producers and the artist society. It does not yet have the support of the author society, which is SBA. Uh, it has the institutional communication support from ICEP, which is our, our foreign trade agency. Gerald is here in, in representation of ICEP. And then for individual missions, we also have the support of the Arts Council, DGH. Um, but usually in the situations of a country focus. So not for all the missions that we do every year. Um, and uh, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Uh, yeah, sometimes we've worked also with uh, the, the, the tourism board for, for specific uh, events that, that we do. Usually when we invite international journalists to come to Portugal, uh, the, the tourism board is, is interested in, in assisting us with that. Um, and what else? Yeah, and, and uh, the, so the, it, it's a fairly recent operation, two years. Um, at the Eurosonic Country Focus last year, we were invited to join the MA network, which is the European Music Exporters Exchange. And then at the elections of MA, um, France for Music Austria and I are now colleagues on the board of, of MA, the, the Music Exporters Exchange. And that project is going very well. So we're very excited about the, the Music Moves Europe preparatory actions for what comes after 2020. And uh, that's sort of a panoramic view of, of, of this session, just by way of an introduction. I don't know, uh, you know, the concept of a pop-up session is not about a soliloquy or a monologue from me, so I'm going to shut up and, and, you know, sort of let you guys um, ask any questions or it could be about anything really. It doesn't have to be about why Portugal or, you know, it could be about Ronaldo or <laughs> surfing or Pastéis Nata, whatever you feel like. Really. Uh, this is a very informal session, so it, it's the, the, the structure is all, is all wrong. We should probably be like in a campfire with a guitar or something. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, and we can talk about music. <laughs> so, I don't know, if anybody wants to introduce themselves and say something. Please. Hi, so um, I was cu cu curious about uh, the results, the changes that you've seen after each stage, after you set up the festival for the, for the Portuguese artists. Because I know who you are, can you introduce yourself for everybody else? Yeah, so uh, my name is Karina Sato. I'm an artist manager and I also run um, a music conference and uh, showcase festival in Bucharest, in Romania. And we had set up um, kind of an export office substitute. And I'm asking because after we did the, um, the conference in, uh, in Bucharest, we realized that there were more artists, Romanian artists, being selected at other showcase festivals, and I was curious about how it did happen for you. So after after every mission, whether it's 
an export mission in the true sense of the word, like coming here to Waves or going to Eurosonic with the 23 artists and the companies that we had participating in the ICEP stand at Eurosonic, the, the Portugal Lounge, which was done under the brand Inspiring Portugal. Um, after every mission, Ana Rita uh, has the terrible job of bugging people with questionnaires. And so we ask the participants to tell us what the experience was like, uh, including <coughs> the revenue that is generated from <coughs> this mission, any mission. So anyway, we, we really want to do this sort of questionnaire. We want to do it like you know, the week after the event, when the memory is fresh. We want to do it like three months after the event to sort of gauge the follow-up period. And then we do it at the end of the year. And we do it at the end of the year, and I think we're even, I'm, I'm even going to suggest to the board of Y Portugal that we repeat it in the second year, because we're now feeling like some of the artists that performed at Eurosonic 2017 are still getting results a year and a half later. So, or yeah, almost two years later. So, so I, it's very important for us to use this metric to, to realize that between all the institutions involved in a mission like the Eurosonic Country Focus, where the investment was very, very close to 100,000 euros between all the parts, um, yielded at the end of last year close to 900,000 euros in, in generated revenue between uh, publishing deals, record deals, festivals, touring income, uh, sinks. So this is very important to gauge. And funny enough, that number of one to nine falls exactly in line with the results from uh, Vanessa Reed's PRS Foundation, which I think was one pound to 8.9 pounds, if I'm not mistaken, of the UK Showcase Fund. Um, so with that result in hand, we went back to the GDA Foundation, which was P Pedro Oliveira was here today. And I said to Pedro, I said, look, this is not a coincidence. If, if we're looking at the same results from Eurosonic, what we need to institutionalize, well, not in the bad sense of the word, but it, what we need to formalize is a Portuguese showcase grant, same as the PRS Foundation has. And so the GDA Foundation <coughs> set up the GDA showcase program based on a recommendation from Y Portugal. And that's <coughs> been operational. I mean, and they were super quick to understand the concept and to, to make it happen. That's been operational since January of this year. So all the artists now that get invited to a circuit of showcase festivals can get a travel contribution, which we didn't have before. Um, so every result that we get, we make it count for another result. So for example, um, at Eurosonic next year, next year, next January, the, the Music Moves Europe Talent Awards are going to be presented, and there are no Portuguese ar artists listed. Why? Because the metrics that are being used is international airplay and Spotify numbers. And even if an artist like Surma maybe has enough plays, or Rodrigo Leão, I don't know who, who well, Rodrigo wouldn't qualify because it's for new artists. Um, we are now keenly aware that we're missing international radio promotion to go along with the showcases that our artists play. So the next step is going to go back to the right societies, the GDA and Audiogest, and say we've identified a gap, a funding gap, that is making Portuguese musical products, in this case records, miss out on European airplay. So if we know that, that we need to, to fund this mechanism, we are going to go back, and I've had very useful meetings here with uh, a, a radio plugger who works European-wide and has done some good work for Music Austria. And you know, because Miguel Pereira from Audiogest, the, the the producers, for the phonogram producer society from Portugal was here this morning, and, and the plugger was sitting across the room. I already introduced him, and guess what? Miguel said, "Oh, 
This is funny because the board of Algiers discussed this a month ago, and we're on the same page. We we've already felt that this was useful, and so every every quantification of results that we make, we take it back home and we try and make it count. Uh, and <coughs> what you're doing in Bucharest with with the focus on um, professionalization and education, also for the for the for the sector. Going back to some of what AME as an independent trade association does in Portugal, it does a, a, a series of workshops in Lisbon and in Porto, but that we would like to decentralize and take into the smaller cities around the country. Um, and the workshops are on all sorts of music professionals development. So from uh, you know digital development to music publishing, sync, uh, Contracts, uh, whatever, whatever the topics that the associates identify as, as their points of interest, we try and do that. And this year, we also started the first music business MBA postgraduate course in Portugal. And funny enough, that's in it's not in Lisbon or in Porto; it's in Coimbra, which is traditionally the city of knowledge in Portugal. It's very famous for its university, and we're doing this MBA with the Coimbra Business School. Um, and it's already in its first edition with, uh, yeah, about 15, 15 postgraduate students doing this MBA. Um, and so it's really sort of a, an, an, an innovation because we've never had anything like that for music in Portugal before. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you. More questions, please. Or just comments. Introduce yourselves and talk about anything. Mm. Um, I promote more Brazil, a real station like you know based on punk rock, you know rock in general. And uh, this year we are like press partner of Hot Open Air in Europe. Yeah. And uh, my question is because as a Brazilian press, always been talked to with before as well. We don't know much what's going on in Portugal. I can see your face already. <laughs> and uh, I'd really like to know how is the scenario like for bands in general in Portugal? Because as I said, there, we just know about well, Portugal, the music's part of yeah. that, that's it. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's clearly, um, I feel a special kinship with Romania. Because when I went to Romania, um, I was in a lovely town called Brasov. Um, and I was there maybe 2002 or 2003. And it reminded me of Portugal about the same length of time after the, the dictatorship. So, um, This seems like a strange answer to your question, but I mean, there's a rationale to it. Um, the type of cars that you saw on the road, the way people lived in their houses, reminded me of Portugal about 10 to 15 years after our fascist dictatorship ended in 74. It felt very similar in Romania after the, the communist dictatorship ended much later. And I'm getting to that because um, I think after any kind of dictatorial regime, whether it's left wing or right wing, the result is quite similar in that it takes the country um, some time to develop. And so I, I, I don't think that Portugal has really had the chance yet to talk about rock music because Fado was, of course, the uh, baby of the fascist regime, because it, it, it teaches you to accept your fate. Fado means fate, okay? So the whole message of Fado is that you cannot do anything about um, your situation. You should be resigned and accepting your fate. And you know this might seem controversial, because not all the Fado singers, by any stretch, <coughs> felt that way about Fado, but it was appropriated by, by the regime. And 
another result of that was that a lot of, uh, and this is very, now I'm going really into a, a personal mode here, but a, a lot of the, the, the Portuguese traditional chordophone instruments, the viola breguesa, marentina, tuaira, uh, campanissa, that sort of made their way around the world to the islands, to Brazil, and the cavaquinho went to Hawaii and turned in, into the ukulele. A lot of these instruments were, were almost gone extinct because fado was the thing. So if you play the fado, the Portuguese guitar with the fado, that's good. If you play the popular stuff, that's bad. Why is it bad? Because that's the shit that you play around the dinner table. And around the dinner table, you're gonna write Bob Dylan-ish folk songs about the times they are changing, and we don't want the times to be changing. We want you to accept your fucking fate. And so, as a result, the very notion of, of rock music or any kind of music that is, is, has an international flavor to it really was very underground. It was illegal, it was underground. So you, you, you had, to, in the 60s, you had to trace, track down your Beatles records in, in a rather subterfugian way. And then, that, that's gonna take, <coughs> it, it, it takes its time. That's not to say that there, there aren't, like Coimbra, Coimbra Rock City, there's, you, you've got like the legendary Tiger Man and lots of rock bands coming from Coimbra. Um, You've got really alternative music, experimental music coming from Braga. Um, Barcelos has an amazing music scene. It's 120,000 population, but, but there's uh, an incredibly vibrant music scene there. Um, but only, only now are these cities' scenes coming to the fore. Um, because we need time, basically. It, it's gonna take time to, 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 to overcome so, some of the damage that was done in the 20th century. Um, and that's really my answer for it. I think, I think that what we try and do on the Y Portugal platform is to invite festivals and artists to sign up, and it's a work in progress because uh, in, in terms of the privacy rules and the, 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 the sharing of personal data, we can't just like put up everything ourselves and say, here, contact this person, because they have to approve this. So. So that's, it, it's going to take time to fill up the database. But there is a rock category there, so you'll be able to, to find uh, specific genres of new music made in Portugal. And Sergio's got his yeah, art. want to add something to that topic? Do you think because Brazil is so close to Portugal with the language, like Spain is, that also might be a barrier because they're so close to it? Um, if we're exporting music to Austria, uh, the language <coughs> barrier, there is no. It's a different language, but Brazil speaks all in Portuguese. It's going to be easier. I'm harder. more interested in what you think. I think I think it should be easier because since we brothers, we speak the same language, right? different accents, but we speak the same language. I think it would be should be easier, but the way how I see is a lot of Brazilian artists and music and everything in Portugal. We have nothing from Portugal in Brazil. And I go like, what the hell? I mean, you know, I mean, here in Austria, you hear like German bands here. And I think in Germany, they also have Austrian bands, right? I think, and speak the same language. And the only thing that divides us is the, the ocean. I mean, it's <laughs> big. <laughs> 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 we have to in boats. <laughs> and it's just a little pond in the water. And nowadays, we have what? As I was talking to them before. What's that Facebook? Everything and and and, and well, I still don't you know. understand why the Portuguese artists they don't come to Brazil. The only one was like back in the eighties called. He was played in this TV show Silvio Santos. Um, oh, I forgot his name now. Eighties. In the eighties, nineties. What genre? What music? Kind of. Pop music, Portuguese style. He's a blonde guy, you know, short. He was very famous in, in Silvio Santos TV, SBT. Not quite. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> was the only one that he was new. Yeah. No, nothing else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, why can't be that change, you know? Well, going back to your ocean thing, mm -hmm. that band from Braga I mentioned earlier, Peixe of Yelm which means fish airplane, they could get to Brazil no problem. <laughs> <laughs> With, whether they're a fish or whether they're airplane. But I, I think really, 
it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. Because I, I think, first of all, the, the Portuguese accent in Brazil is often very not well, not well understood. We, no. in, in continental Portugal, we have the Brazilian soap operas, the telenovelas. And so we understand Brazilian accents no problem, usually. But the opposite is not always true. Yeah, we so don't understand you guys 100%. So outside Fado, <laughs> again, outside Fado, if you're singing in Portuguese, like Ortach Violeta, which is very worthy Portuguese, or Peixe Vian, which is poetry, but it, I mean, it's almost like Sivar Ross, where he, it's not really a language at all. It's so musical the way he sings. I think that, that would be very difficult in, in Brazil. So that leaves us with the artists who sing in English. And I remember a quote from Sepultura, um, <laughs> where somebody from Sepultura said, in America, they were giving an interview to MTV or somebody, and uh, no offense, but they said, to sing in Portuguese, it sounds like shit. And I don't, I don't agree, but, but, I, but I can also understand that for rock music, it can be weird to, to, to be playing a musical style that is entirely Anglo-American. Sure. But doing it in Portuguese, I, I, and that's weird because you're not innovating musically. You're you're doing Anglo-American music in another language, and that's that's a bit strange. I don't think there's much of an international market for that approach, but th there is an international market <laughs> if you you play um, the, the, the if, if if the genre of the music fits the language that it is sung in in an innovative way, and I think. It, that's that's what Lisbon, like Rui Miguel Abreu uh, um, w was saying in the Portuguese panel, Lisbon is really a multicultural epicenter of crossover music. So all sorts of different genres from Brazil, from Africa, from wherever, are, are really getting mixed up there and new music is being made um, from Buraca sound system onwards. Uh, but not so much in rock. Because I, I think by its very notion, rock music yeah, I love rock music, uh, <laughs> but, but rock music has kind of remained quite static uh, since, let's say, the Rolling Stones or something. You know, like, I mean, there hasn't been, there hasn't been, you know, it's not much of a stretch of an imagination to go from the Rolling Stones to Guns N' Roses. It's not very different, um, and and, um, and so I think the case could be made that that probably more up-to-date music genres like electronic music or hip-hop or whatever else is, is sort of more 21st century. I don't know. I hope not because I like rock music. But, um, but so that's, that's probably another difficulty thing. And your reference of Spain, I see Spain and Portugal as two completely different cultures. I can, let me just add one thing because at Westway, I don't know if it was your pitch, but there was an amazing band called Chicha. Yeah. They're from Arizona, but they have a lot of influence from... Cumbia. Cumbia. So, Mexico, so Colombia. Some of the songs are sung in Spanish. So, is it rock? It's an amazing fusion for those who have to listen to it. So, we could play the West, I got to read it. And they made the mix because they have the Spanish. With the exactly. English, so, we can yeah. do that. So, so that, I mean, that's, that's a great... I mean, if I saw them at South by Southwest because I was going to see a show... Ah, what was the band? Uh, there was a Canadian friend of mine who was playing at Hotel Vegas at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. And I went early because I didn't want to miss his show. And the band that played before, uh, it was, uh, the band I went to see was called Elephant Stone uh, by a friend of mine from Montreal called Richie Deer. Great guy, sitar player, amazing bass player like Paul McCartney, really, really good. Anyway, I went to see him, but before this band from Tucson, Arizona played called Chicha, or Chicha, I'm not, it's X I X A, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and they're managed by Christoph Storbeck, who's a, a German manager living in Palermo, Sicily. Uh, and, um, and they came on stage, and they were wearing all black. They had the backs to the audience, long coats. They looked like desperados with a red, <laughs> red bandana, dark hats. And they went into this noisy feedback thing. And I was like, oh, it's like the MC5, you know? It's, and then, you know, just, just as they went like bang, and you get and you have the feedback going everywhere and the hats and they turn around and they go <laughs> I'm like, what? And they went into this kumbia rhythm. And it was it was unbelievable. 
and it blew my mind. So I, I spoke to the programmer of Westway. I said, Louis, <laughs> you gotta book these guys. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and they played an amazing show in Portugal as well. And I, I think I think that's rock and roll innovation because they're 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 picking up on their Latin roots and making something really amazing out of it. And I think that's where rock music needs to move in, into the future. And and um, so I've just answered my own question. Because I was yeah. saying I hope not, and I know that it's not. You know, no, no. Uh, thank you, Sergio. <laughs> no, but no, no, you, you nailed it. Um, I was thinking exactly the same as you uh, in terms of like the. I'm a, a, a rock and roll lover as well, and I love rock music as well. Um, and I was to say exactly the same because the the. the we, we are used to listen to American rock, British rock, and that's it. And when we move to other trends like metal, that's slightly different because people don't, doesn't understand properly what they say. <laughs> and that's why the metal bands like Moonspell from Portugal are well known internationally. Um, and and, and th that's something because people doesn't understand what they say, and that's the point. When 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 we when we have bands and rock bands, that front, then? people can understand exactly everything and the genres. People will look always as a copy as the American bands or a copy as the British bands. And when you say like the the rock bands needs to innovate, needs to add um, cultural uh, influences from the specific punches and, and do a fusion of, of, of music styles into rock music, that will change. And you, you said the example of Baracas on Sistema, that is probably the, the most recent international great Portuguese band that toured uh, uh, around, uh, around the world and did major tours in, in, in America. And they played Rock in Rio Brazil, and they, right? Yeah, and they played Rock in Rio Brazil and they played man, man, many festivals worldwide. Um, actually, they played several times at Rock in Rio, okay. uh, in, 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 even in Lisbon uh, yeah. and, and Brazil also. But the, 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 the reason why they were so good is because they reinvented a style that was a fusion of rock, uh, of rock, rap, um, uh, electronic, and, um, and, and that was African niche styles, and that, that fusion made them so different. That's why they were so big. And if you look like, uh, uh, and I have that feeling as, as a, uh, a, a promoter or, or being part of a music festival, like um, when you look at European uh, rock bands or you look at Portuguese rock bands, I always have, uh, have the same feeling. Oh, that sounds me like uh, Radiohead, like you said, of Patient Young. This sounds me like that band or that. And there's no uh, a special ingredient that makes me look at that band and that's great. That's well, absolutely that, great. That's, that's the, the thing. That's, that's, that's me. I just want to back up yeah. a little bit. Dan missed my little cumbia dance. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> seeing Shisha play and doing precisely this thing we're talking about of taking rock and roll to another level, mixing it with cumbia, really blew my mind. And I haven't. When you work in the music industry. You can, it gets a little, sometimes, I don't know how you feel, I, I'll admit it, it gets tiresome to listen to new music all the time, yeah? And, and it's difficult to feel, you know, to reconnect to when you were like 16 and you find a new artist that you really like. Mm -hmm. And to get that buzz from watching Shisha and South by Southwest was awesome. Because I don't often get that buzz anymore. Um, I wish I did, that's the truth. Um, and so even in the context of my work with White Portugal, sometimes I'll be at a meeting and somebody says, oh, can you listen to this? I said, no, I don't listen to music. You know, I'm here to teach you how to be a better professional and how to, how to internationalize your product. I am not here to judge or analyze the quality of your product. That's really up to you and, and your team. So it's a, it's a very, anyway, but going back to this thing, um, it, uh, I just totally lost the train of thought. <laughs> do, you, do you think radio could help? Because I know Legendary Tiger Man did a tour of Brazil, and then he doesn't know him. So should they really? Be I've never heard of it. Well, I mean, you know, as far as rock music from Portugal, I'm a total virgin into the Portuguese stuff. <laughs> he is the hardest working man in, in Portuguese rock and roll. Mm -hmm. He has a manager in Portugal that only works in Portugal. 
So everything he does in France, internationally, he worked himself. His name is Paul Furtado. He's been at this. He's been at this for years and years and years, touring on the road, hard, hardest working guy in Portuguese rock and roll. Uh, and he just played the Bond Festival last week under what export office? Bureau Export France. Because he has a French publisher, and because why Portugal is only two years old, so we can't support him as easily as the French can. Um, but I, I, I think in a way, Yeah, I'm not going to say anymore. You mentioned radio. Could radio, radio could help? Radio help. So, I uh, a thing that I'm from Austria, <laughs> and uh, I think um, what I've done, as far as my possibilities can go, is that I've collected underground music, for example, from Austria, metal in that case, and I asked friends in other countries, like, do you know a radio show? <laughs> And I came there as guest, bringing the music, doing DJ set, doing the radio show, talking to people, going to venues, and seeing that there is a, um, a tandem possibility, so to speak, yeah. that there is one band there that could fit another band in the other country. Or there is a radio show in one country that could fit as a partner for a radio show in another country. And combine these two, because then there is only the one guy from this radio and the one guy from that radio, yeah. and they can talk to each other without my help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just a connector, so to speak. Yeah. So, and I think uh, subgenres might have the possibility to connect more easily in a personal kind of way. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think totally that also it's it's still like I said, it's early days in the sense that we've only now started thinking about European radio connections. Sure. We've relied for the last couple of years on the European Broadcasters Union, so the public radio stations, mm -hmm. which of course, by, its, by their very own nature, they all go to Eurosonic in January, but, but they're, they're very, um, because they have a public mission, they have to be very generalized in terms of the aesthetics that they, that they play. And so now we're looking at doing some radio promotion on an European level, and the next step, I think, has to be what you're saying, because some of what, what the radio pluggers are telling us is that if you have special niche genres, that will need to be a special uh, connection made between different programs of the radio station. Also on an emotional level. Yeah. Sure. So, so I, I think that's, really, that's kind of like, I, if we start generalized European radio promotion in 2019, I would hope to get to that level in 2020. Uh, you know. Being optimistic, which I always <laughs> have. <am. laughs> yeah, I have to be. Yeah. Um, uh, are we out of time? Yes. I think we should. Uh, you know who's the most hard working man with uh, You are. Conference, not you, because you have to go to the next. Well, I have to go to the next. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you watch the video, you can see.